All right, welcome to the Legacy Podcast. All right, we have our new episode here with Pratty Tawari. I'm super excited to uh, to announce this next guest. I mean, Pratty's got a diverse background. Uh, at a young age, he's developed a lot of different businesses in a successful way. And uh, this is going to be a really, really interesting uh, conversation. We had a little uh, pre-conversation here before the interview, and I think that um, you guys are going to get a lot of uh, sound advice here, a lot of success information, a lot of motivation, um, and a lot of inspiration, hopefully, here. So welcome, Pratty, to the uh, podcast. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for, for having me on, man. I'm super excited to be on. And like I said, before we start hitting record, my, my goal with like, people listening in, my goal really is that you listen to this podcast and you can take one actionable advice and you can apply it to your life no matter where you are. You're just getting started. You're in the middle, already seeing some success. No matter where uh, you are, uh, you can apply something and, and, and really um, it, it can help you. That, that's really why, why, why I'm here. And that's going to be the goal from start to finish for this episode. You heard it. You heard it here, guys. So make sure you grab a notepad and a pen because even if you take away one or two little notes from this thing that's able to help you you know, project yourself in a different direction, that's what, that's what the goal is today. So, so Pratty, can you tell us, you know, I mean, again, a lot of success combined, pressed into, you know, a short life so far. Can you give us, you know, some cliff notes on how you got here so far? Yeah. So long story short, uh, I moved here to the States uh, late, in my, late in my teens. I went to college here. I uh, started my first business in college. Um, you know, long story short, it was a, it was a, a supplement delivery uh, business. Um, you know, uh, just the story really with it was that at the time people were looking to, to really buy supplements on, on campus, but there was no place to get them. Like the people didn't have a car to go in UNT. Amazon Prime wasn't really around. It was still two days. So I would basically buy supplements in bulk from a wholesaler and I would store them in my dorm room, put up a website, and I would deliver them in 20 minutes. Um, and I figured out people would pay a premium for really quick delivery and shipping times. And of course, Amazon figured it out later and became a massive um, corporation. Um, but that was my first business. And I would go on a bike and I would just deliver protein to people's dorms and at the gym. Um, sounds nice. like a, a, you know, it's a super small idea, but listening to people and really caring about their problems. Um, and that was a business actually that had scaled and we had, um, a lot of uh, kids then that were riding the bikes and delivering on campus. And we copied that model in other schools and I actually ended up that business became large enough where I actually sold my stake in that, my business in, you know, in the business and yeah, man, it's just doing one small thing like that. And that's a catalyst for now all of a sudden people like, Oh, you actually have a business that you had employees, you were profitable. And you sold the business and that story of like just a small piece of success, um, that kind of becomes your brand. And then people started bringing their business ideas to me. Um, but that's going to be like the big thread of like the stuff that I talk about in my own, you know, personal brand and stuff that I'm going to talk about on the show is like, you know, we all talk about massive action and sometimes people look at like now a resume and all the stuff that I've been doing, which is looks big, but it's all by doing small things. Like, like you said, dude, just, if you have like one thing that you can take away from the show, that's enough. Like you don't have to change the world and start a billion dollar company and be the next Uber. Like that's awesome. And you will get there, but to get there, you need to have, you need to have just show a small amount of competency and small things you do. And that's going to start, start your brand. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't be on this podcast today if I hadn't yeah. listened to my friend and delivered those, um, samples and bottles of protein on my bike back when I was 18. So there's so much power in that. I hope that the listeners are paying attention to that there's so much power because I think in today's day and age, everybody wants to, wants to push the easy button and fast forward yep. to making millions a month. And what they don't realize and they skip right over is exactly what you just said. You can be the best realtor in your office just by starting to take bigger listings, having the guts to go out and take a bigger listing. You can be the best flipper in town by taking action and flipping a house or two. You can be the best insurance guy by learning your craft really well and going right. and selling a couple great uh, you know uh, members into your product right so like you can be the best you can create huge massive success but it starts in a very very small scale and everybody's looking for that fast forward yep. they want to leapfrog you know the basics yep and and what you just you just hit the nail on the head and that's and and that's amazing. So the, so then Amazon went and stole your idea, and then, then <laughs> well, no, I don't give myself that much credit. Uh, <laughs> but it's 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 just um, it's listening, and and the big part of that too is like um, I talk about this a little bit. It's called arbitrage, which I think is really key. Whatever you want to do, you want to scale your life or your business or relationship, whatever you want to do, but you got to find 
what's your in? Like what's, what makes you you? And so I think we talk about entrepreneurship, right? Because a lot of people are trying to find financial independence and they start a business. Starting a business for the sake of starting, starting one is a very bad idea. Yeah. Uh, it's a very odd thing to do. I, I'm not a big proponent of it. I always say new businesses shouldn't exist. Or if you are a new realtor in town or new developer, there's no reason for you to exist. There's existing developers who are much better than you much more money than you have better relationships. They should develop it. You should not develop any of that stuff. So as an entrepreneur, how can I say such a thing? Cause that's what I do. I create new businesses. Yep. Uh, the reason being is because you have to provide something to the marketplace. That's so unique, so unique that no one else can do it. And it's not about your story and it's about the product that you're providing and the value you're providing. And there's a difference. So a lot of times um, now people bring business ideas to me and what they're trying to sell is themselves. They're like, hey, man, I had a tough childhood. I struggled growing up and I don't really like working for a boss. And, but what they're not talking about is like, well, what are you bringing to the market? How are you making someone yeah. else's life better? And the business isn't about you. It's about the value you provide to the marketplace. So you have to really figure out what are you providing for the marketplace that's so unique that no one else can do it. And that's much more unique and much more, whether it's time consuming or much more difficult or much more resource intensive, even for the bigger guys. And only then should you go out and make a project. So um, here, um, you know, any type of business that I create or anything that you want to create a side hustle and really scale it or whatever it is you're trying to even break it into real estate, find a gap in the market where you can dominate. Um, not just be one player. I've always learned it's better to be a big fish uh, in a small pond uh, than it is to be a small fish in a big pond. You're going to get lost. Um, so that's always been my thing. Even in real estate, when I got involved, I, I saw in Boston, man, there were like a lot of like fix and flippers and they're getting started and they were due listings up until um, about a million dollars. Those were, you go into open houses and they were like flooded. Then there were the listings like from five and a half million bucks over, like all the big guys would be there. And there was a gap in the market between about a million and a half to like three or four where it was too big for the small guys and too small for the big guys. And that's the area that I really went into that I wanted to get into when I started in development. I was like, that's a place that no one really wants to play ball. So I'm going to go in there. So the big, big takeaway here too is like find your arbitrage, find where you you, you can only exist and thrive, but you can dominate that space. And that's, that's that small thing that you do is then going to propel you into bigger things down the line. So you can play the bigger game in commercial development and do the $10 million plus listings, but you've got to find how you're going to get in in the first place. That's the hardest part. Like what's your hook? What's your, what's your story? What's your hook? You know? Yeah. Creating, creating impact. And, and, and you touched, you touched on it at the very beginning, which is, and people do this backwards all the time. They think about me, 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 what, right. what, what can I do? What can right. I bring? But they're not flipping the script and thinking about what the avatar, what the client, what the customer is looking yep. for. They want, to, they want to see you differentiate yourself, but they're really, they, they, people care about themselves. Yep. People, 100% that, you know, wh whether or not they, they, they talk about it, they say things, you know, they're, they're, their actions are that, that they're looking towards the inside, right? So yep. people, people mess this up with marketing, by the way, all the time. You do your marketing and it's like, I'm the best, I can do this, I'm, the, I'm this, I'm that. Right. They don't want to see I words. They don't, they don't want to know about you. Yeah. They want to know about them. You know, right. what kind of value can you bring them? So... Um, you know, first of all, defining what your clients need and want is, is probably the most impactful thing you can do when you're trying to decide, you know, if you should be in business or, or you know, if your business can create that gap or you can find that gap. You need to figure out if there's, a, if there's clients for that gap, right? And then, yeah, and the, yeah. The, sorry, continue. Yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I think there's a big need, uh, big need for that because I feel like a lot of people aren't, uh, aren't focused on listening uh, really well, but continue on. Yeah, but so many people do that backwards. I was just gonna, I was yeah. just gonna finish it up with. I think ego takes over a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of us, and you know, in small business. Right. You know, the first thing we do is we say, well, you know, I'm really good at this X thing, and then we turn it into a lifestyle business. And next thing you know, the whole business is, is surrounded around that person and what their capabilities are. When the reality of it is, right. You know, real success, the real launch, the real takeoff comes from focusing on what the client's needs are and then finding a solution to it. Yeah. And that's hard. We're not really taught that, right? Because no. all of our lives, like in school, like we're talking about, what do I want in my career? What, what classes do I want to take? And so yep. there's a skill, right? So there's hearing and then there, there's listening. But I also say, people say, oh, you got to listen as an entrepreneur. I don't think that's enough because yeah. you know, I, I live in Boston across the street. There's like, like three psychotherapists and I can go and pay 300 bucks an hour and they will listen to all my problems and they'll want me to stay there for hours. So they get paid more and it's, and they can, will probably find something to diagnose me with, but how come in big cities, there's all these psychotherapists and psychologists, but we still seek friends. Why do I still, I, I, I call my sister or I call my, my parents now and then, or if I have great friends, why, why do I do that? 
you know, isn't it better to just, you know, make an appointment, go in and she'll just listen or he'll just listen to me or shrink. Which is, why do we do that? We do that is because listening isn't enough. We want people that really care about us and there's a difference. So an entrepreneur um, will, will not only listen, but will care so much about someone else's problem that they'll stop whatever they're doing in their life and sacrifice everything to solve it. Right. And it, it's in and, and that. And I think there's a difference. And I think people think about entrepreneurship and they think about like, uh, like hedge fund and, and bankers and they think it's the same thing. It's not like I will say it's a totally different ball game. Like you're, this is not Wolf of Wall Street. This is entrepreneurship is about, you know, I go in my job sites and I roll my sleeves and I help out. This is like getting dirty and you create value and stuff. It's not about playing with other people's money and sitting in a bank and bo both are difficult, but it's a different, that lifestyle is not, you know, people get, uh, sometimes they intern with me, kids like, Oh, I want to, I want to do this too. And then, and then like, wait, this is not as much fun. I thought like, where are the parties? <laughs> Where's the stuff? Like we work, work all night and we create value. We, we sit, I, mean, I, I create my businesses, uh, half of them in, at, at Panera and I was drawing in coffee shops and figuring out stuff and you're doing that for hours. It's not that life. So I think um, that's where people get confused. But li listening is a forgotten art, but caring uh, is even much more difficult. And we see that now where more and more people, they feel like, man, automation and all these signs we wanted a lot of it we want our life to be digital but actually wait a minute we, we don't so yeah. uh so there's a community aspect that's moving back in and i think the entrepreneurs and people that are showing going to show care they're going to win spot on spot on man i love that guys rewind that and listen to it again so spot mm -hmm. on if you walk in here you can tell any one of my team i say this all the time you got to ask better questions right and then listen and but then you got to create solutions right, right. We're not asking the tip. A lot of us don't ask the difficult questions to clients. Like we, we tiptoe around what we think and then we assume the answers instead of really getting deep into the questions. Right. You know, if you're listening to this, most people in most businesses, I don't care if you're in sales or in you know, customer relations, whatever you're in, your client will answer you if you, if you build enough rapport. You know, you'll yep. get the answers you need. And then when you get those answers and you truly want to help, like Pradi just said, and you want to get to the, the solution, then you can create a solution. But you need to ask deeper questions a lot of times so you can actually build the rapport, so you can actually care about your client, actually build that relationship, and then create solutions. Now you're taking it all the way across the finish line. That's what separates you know, people that, that generally are more, way more successful in their practice, whatever that, whatever that industry is. So um, that's, that's awesome stuff. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And the same goes with like wealth generation and all stuff. I mean, it's never, you don't actually, you don't, it's the wealth that you create isn't really for yourself. It's more, you create more for the marketplace and, and whatever you take in is actually less is like a multiples less than what you actually create for the marketplace. And that's, and I think there's a, uh, there's a mindset shift that goes, it's like, how much is my income? What am I putting in my pocket? Whereas I think that the mindset shift is okay. How much, how much more money am I creating for other people? And that's, Mm. And that's the crazy part. And we see people that are really wealthy. And you're like, oh man, like, you know, uh, Jeff from Amazon has like, I don't know, 50 billion. I don't know what he makes, but mm -hmm. the amount of wealth that he's created for with Amazon for other people is probably 10 times more. So he's actually created more wealth for other people than he actually puts in his own pocket. But that's the mindset shift, right? How can I make other people wealthier, better, stronger, faster, whatever it is. And then you, you actually, as he, as the CEO, whatever, take way less than everyone else. Whereas the income approaches like what am I making what's my salary and it's just a there's no right and wrong it's just a mindset shift and unless you go through the mindset shift it's going to be hard to do to do this to be maybe fully self-developed or actually go into entrepreneurship or whatever you're trying to do go on out on your own you have to have that mindset shift um, and I think that's super important spot on spot on like I heard a statistic the other day and, and don't quote me on this podcast but I heard a statistic the other day that Amazon is directly responsible for 50 percent of online sales in America all yep. online sales, every product that's sold online, 50% of it goes through Amazon. Now, right. you think about that, they're a reseller. They're, you know, they're not the direct seller of most of yep. those products. So Jeff's taking a penny out of every 10 cents that's made or a dollar that's made. And you know, he's making really, really good money as a result, but he's making everyone else wealthy as a result. Yep. There's so many resellers and e-com people that are doing business through his platform. And he's developed a resource for them all to make great businesses happen through him. Yes. And taking a little bit through. So to, to your point, when you help other people, you know, you're going to inevitably help yourself, but you got to create value there in the marketplace first. hundred percent. Other people first. So it's awesome. Awesome. Uh, awesome point. So probably let me ask you a question, you know, coming up, you know, do you have a favorite memory or a favorite, you know, thing that happened to you while you were growing these, maybe that like aha moment or that like, yeah. wow, I can't believe that happened. That was, you know, that like epiphany moment that happened yeah. sometime during one of these businesses that you've built? 
Yeah, there's actually one story. Um, I, I've, I've learned now, I, I tell a, quite a, peop- a lot of people that are going into game. I remember this is one of our uh, first businesses that I was uh, selling, which was not this project, it was another business. And we went through a, like a due diligence phase. So basically when you sell a business, there's you know, lawyers back and forth and then there's the last stage due diligence phase, which is the closing. And then the, um, the accountants and the attorneys from the other side and, and some of the other players from the other uh, from a private equity firm would come to our, came to our office. And uh, they were, you know, going through their paperwork and due diligence and see how the operations were going. And I remember at some point, like one of the partner, I was like, "Hey, how's it going?" He, at one point, the partner took me to the offices from the other side. He said, uh, "Pretty, we, um, I gotta be honest, I don't think we, we, we can't buy your business." And I was like, "What the hell?" Like we were so excited because you know that this was what we wanted and it worked. And I was like, "Dude, we've had a this was we've been talking about this for weeks, and I thought we were at the finish line." And I, and he and I was like, "What's what's going on?" He said, "I have a problem." And I was like, what problem do you have? And uh, he said, my problem is that you're here. And I didn't understand. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean? That's my business. Of course, I'm going to be here. But long story short, what he was trying to say, that I was involved in every part of the business from operations to fulfilling Mm -hmm. to project managing. I was in every meeting room going in. I was literally almost, I was micromanaging everyone. Mm -hmm. And what he was trying to say is that this business isn't built to scale. This business has grown because of you. And if you're gone, this business has no legs. And that's the day I became an entrepreneur versus a small business owner. Small business owner, you do everything. You don't build it to scale. And I, that flipped the switch. And that's how I actually built myself up through that conversation. And what's funny, they ended up not buying our company. They bought another company, which was doing like seven or eight times less of a revenue, but they had systems in place that were automated and I didn't, and they chose a company that was making less money and we did not sell that business ever. So huge lesson for me. So awesome. Awesome. That, that again, so it's such a good takeaway. I love that. There's a good buddy of mine uh, named judge Graham just wrote a book called scale of speed. And he talks about that exact same concept. In fact, right. he talks, he calls it a lifestyle business versus an enterprise business. Right. Yep. And, and it's exactly the same thing. And, and so many different business owners, and I talk about this a lot. And, you know, frankly, I'm not judging one or the other. There's people right. that build lifestyle businesses and yep. they love to work it and they're in their 60 hours a week and that's their grind and they enjoy it. And that's, there's nothing good or bad or indifferent about that. Like no, nobody's judging that person. But if you're trying to sell a business and, yep. and that, that life lesson you just taught is so impactful, people that are looking to exit a business, you need to have an enterprise business that's working for you, not yes. you working for it. Yeah, it's a really good life lesson you just taught there. It's it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and it's something that we can we can all use a little bit of. And like you said, man, there's no value judgment. Like you can create a business that's just generating cash flow for you. But I think in general too, I think um, this is about leadership uh, here. And I think a lot of colleagues, even myself, sometimes will complain. You know, you start maybe you start a podcast, maybe you start a digital agency. Like, dude, I can't hire anyone. I was like, oh, what's going on? It's like everyone sucks. They just don't work hard. I work harder than everyone. Like, and no one wants to work so hard. And the question, I, you keep hearing that a lot of times. And at some point you have to ask yourself, are, is everyone in the world just such a bad employee or are you just a bad boss or are you just a bad leader? And the answer a lot of times is the latter um, because we tend to, because I think as when we have an, we are not, we create something, whatever it's small or large, we take so much pride in it that we think it's our child. But you know, if you're in good parenting versus like good parents know that you don't have to be a helicopter parent because if you do that, you create, make the child weak. Like the child can't actually sustain when they're on their own if you're constantly doing everything for them. And I think that's what happens a lot of time for like business owners. They become helicopter parents where they want to, and that's what I was doing. I was like, dude, no one else. I take a lot of pride in my hard work. I was like, dude, no one grinds as much as me. I put a hundred hours, I put in more hours and I'm better than everyone. Um, and there's a superiority thing, but what happens is the employees, they also feel like, wait, I don't get pretty always micromanaging me. So I'm not going to put in hundred percent. And then I'm like, well, he's not putting hundred percent. So it's a cycle. It's a very negative cycle that, mm-hmm. and then the business can't scale. So what I have right now is I outsource everything that if anyone's doing a 65%, but as good as I, they don't have to do be hundred percent as good as I can. I outsource it and I stick with them. Every question I never, I see sometimes entrepreneurs or other guys that I'm helping when something goes wrong or employee can't do it, they get pissed off and like, no, forget it. I'll just do it. Mm-hmm. don't do that. Stop yourself from doing that and just say, nope, we're going to try again and, and give them that faith. Um, and then over time, what that's doing is you're giving them confidence. They're going to grow, but then also you can outsource that and you can work on bigger strategy stuff. Um, and you know, you can say this is just for scaling, you know, as an entrepreneur, but this might be for scaling any, anything in your life. 
whether it's productivity or anything like that. And I think we need to learn to give trust to other people, which comes back to listening to people. But there's just trust is missing. So if you trust people, they'll trust you back and you can actually scale your enterprise and everyone wins from that. So, so, so true. It's, it's so impactful too. And, and I'll tell you one, one little uh, extra that I add to that is I always answer their questions with a question. When they come to me and they say like, you know, you know, uh, we're running into an issue here. You know, what, what do you want us to do? I always, I always respond back. Well, what would you do? Right. What do you think we should do? Or, you know, what if we did this? You yeah. know, like, so I, I'm always trying to get them to think on their feet and create solutions and become, become problem solvers. You want to create a team of leaders. You want people that are going to take action because the fact of the matter is we built our businesses and we failed. We made mistakes. We, we, we made decisions that were wrong right. at some point in time. And we fail to remember that sometimes when we're trying to grow people that are within our team organization, you know, we just assume that they're, they're going to be a hundred percent right a hundred percent of the time and they're yeah. never going to make mistakes. And then we get upset when they make mistakes. But, but folks, like we made mistakes. We still make mistakes every yes. single day. So it's funny you use the 65% because I use, I always say that 80% is the best right. you could possibly expect from your best employee. Right. You know, the fact of the matter is you probably don't work at 80% of your max capacity. If you went back and looked at the last seven days that you put in, right. you wouldn't pay yourself 100% totally, of the salary. <laughs> to totally. I totally agree. And there's a big concept here too. Um, you can't, there's a couple of things in life. Like we're in real estate, right? We negotiate. I negotiate my bank rates. I negotiate um, leases. I negotiate like land prices. But what you can't, there's a couple of things in life you can't negotiate. You can't negotiate attraction, love respect, trust. There's no negotiation for that, right? You can't, I can't, if I'm not attracted to someone, I can't tell, like if I'm not attracted to someone, she can't say anything to me that all of a sudden make me, I just am not. And so I think what a lot of times businesses do incorrectly with their employees, they try to blackmail their employees in, in liking them. And mm -hmm. it doesn't work like that. This is what most businesses do. Okay. If you don't stay here long enough, you're not going to get your bonus. So you have to stay there now to get your bonus, all your incentives. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't want you to, we don't want to build, help you build your resume or anything. No, because if you have a good resume, you might leave. No, 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 We're not, we're going to stop. You want to hold your hostage. So yeah. you have, if you want to take an MBA class, we'll pay for it, but you can't go anywhere else. So it's like a blackmailed system. Go and of course up. the employees are not going to feel motivated because you're yeah. blackmailing them to stay there. Yeah. So I do something different as I started scaling my enterprises of about 120 people uh, that I oversee and manage. And for all of them, every single month, I, I write all the references for them every month. I help them with their resumes and any bonus incentives they get, if they leave, it get paid out right away. So all of them, all of them can leave at any point they want. And they're actually, they, they can, they have better opportunities because the resumes are great. I already write all the references for them and they can actually, all their bonus incentives they get right away. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of crazy. Who does that? But yeah. out of all the 100 people, 125 people, not a single person has ever left. Hmm. And the reason why is because I want to work with people that want to be there. Yeah. And that's the difference. If you're working with people in your office or in your life, whether it's your, the girl that you're dating or the, the people that you're around with, if they really want to be there, it's like, dude, F yes, I want to be here, dude, then your enterprise is going to scale. Of course, you're going to have, you know, yes, I have scaled businesses because everyone in my business, I can call them right now or 11 o'clock, they'll pick up and they'll be there because they really, really, really want to be there. There wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't bully them or blackmail them. And that's how you create, I think, an effective organization. And that's been my philosophy for a long time. That's awesome. I want to respect your time, but I just actually looking over at your one sheet and it reminded me, I forgot to ask you, we actually had hashtag GSD as one of our core values for a lot of time. And I noticed you have get shit done as your, as your right. tagline under. <laughs> so can right. you tell us a little bit about that? And actually maybe where the name comes from for the company as well. Yeah, so uh, Azoth is a uh, it's a supplement company that I, I started, and basically what uh, what it is, it's a nootropic. And people who aren't really super familiar with it, it's kind of a, an, a large field in a supplement category. And um, basically, what nootropics do is that they work the way that caffeine or stimulants do, without actually a lot of the side effects. And it's not like it's like caffeine or anything; they just work totally different. So caffeine raises your um, your central nervous system, so you get really kind of wired. Whereas nootropics, what they do, they go into your system and you have dopamine and serotonin, which are basically your kind of your, your the, the chemicals that your brain releases at you know, pleasure or motivation, um, and it just brings them back to balance. And the question is, well, why does that help? Because most, most of us, through years of caffeine abuse and stress, are, are basically chemicals are totally off-wired. Off and when you take nootropics... Um, they're supposed to make you feel like you've had the best night's rest ever. Like you feel calm, smooth energy. Why did I, why did I get into this? I was in law school at the time and I was scaling businesses. And I was also, I, I compete in bodybuilding. So I was training to, for nationals. 
And I remember at some point it got just so much. And I, I, I just, I was like, man, how am I going to do all this stuff? And I remember talking to my Dean and she was like, Fred, you're going to have to choose. You can't do everything. You're in law school right now. Like this is not, this is not college. So figure it out. So, and I, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to listen to what she had to say. I was like, no, no way. Uh, I, I can do it. And I realized I was going to hit a wall. Um, and I was taking so many energy drinks and caffeine and dude, I was, uh, at some point I, was, I crashed yeah. and I was like, I gotta, I gotta find something. I go online and I heard, hear about something called nootropics and I was like, it sounds crazy. What is this? And I saw that the Russians were using it during the space race to give their astronauts, uh, to really get an edge and to really win in the space race. And I was like, man, this is, I want to get my hands on it. Long story short, it's ordering a lot of product and me and my friend were making it at the chem lab at Boston university, putting it together for our own use, never to sell to anyone. And it took a, a lot of tries. And I remember one time we we're going to the gym. This was like the hundred and I don't know, tenth try or something. And I'm driving my a, a buddy, huge big dude, six five, big dude. And he's he starts crying like while he's driving on the stream. And I was like, dude, are you okay? And I was like, Oh shit, I must have given you something that was like like horrible. And he's like, Pretty, you know, I gotta tell you something, man. I was like, Hey, what's up? And he's like, dude, I've never ever in my life felt so good like I'm feeling right now. And he's like, <laughs> dude, I feel like I've I'm just woken up from like the deepest sleep. And I was like, dude, I think we got something here. So long story <laughs> short, um, I knew I had a formula there and we created the formula and I was just using it for myself, me and my buddy. And the word spread about this product that we were using and we're giving out so much product to our colleagues. And I was like, dude, I think we should make a business out of it. And then of course we professionalized it, work with a manufacturer. And now we're, uh, we've sold, you know, thousands of units uh, all across the globe. And this has now become the, uh, the big the, the business. But the goal of this being, it's a product and a formula for people who want to be productive, which is different than energy drinks and focus pills, because those are just for focus or for energy. But productivity is something totally different. It's about like being in the zone. You know, when you're working in the morning, sometimes you're just in the zone. And that's what we're really going for. So that's what uh, Azot is about. And that's what we've been selling. Awesome. Listen, man, that's, that was incredible. And, and let the whole thing. So, I mean, I want to respect your time and, it, uh, you know, we try to keep it, um, you know, around the half an hour. That's where we're at now. I mean, is there anything I missed as far as questions that anything I didn't cover, anything I didn't get to? No, I, I think we covered a lot of good ground. And I think we talked yeah. about like scaling. We talk about systems. I talk a little bit about nootropics and, and uh, productivity, but yeah, man, I, I think um, the big takeaway, hopefully for a lot of people um, listening in, sometimes you, listen to people and you look at their resumes, you're like, man, is their person is so far ahead. Um, and it's just like, what, what do I do? And when I was younger, I would go to a lot of seminars, like Forbes 30 and a 30 and all this. I was like, man, I, I didn't feel like it relates to me, but the goal, the, the really thing is that um, there, you need to find things that you can apply in your life. And one of the big things to take away with my message is you can do what the big guys can because they're bigger and better than you in many ways, but the big guys can do what you can do either. So mm. revel in the fact that you're small. When you're small, dude, you got so many cool things that you can do that no one, I can ride on a bike and deliver protein in 20 minutes. Amazon cannot do that. <laughs> they cannot do it right now, right? So I, I can write handwritten notes to all my customers when I started my, my, my nootropic company, but big companies that are billion dollar enterprise, they can't write a note to every customer. I can do that. So you play by winning your game. Don't play what the big guys are doing and just celebrate that you're small because when you're small, Dude, you, you can do so many things. That's how all the startups in this country started. They were just small and they could work and do things quicker than some of the bigger enterprises can. So take a lesson from that. And, and when you're right now listening to this, you're like, man, I don't know where to start or I'm stuck or I'm just kind of small scale. I want to leave my nine to five, figure out, make an inventory check, dude. Like, what am I good at? How can I actually leverage the fact that I'm small and, and make that my strength? And I think those are the people that really end up making it. So celebrate it. Don't, don't be down on it. I think that's a big, a big takeaway here. I love it, man. Absolutely awesome stuff. Keep it simple. Get after it. Keep grinding, guys. Build your legacy. Amazing interview. Thanks again for being on, and uh, I appreciate you. Awesome, man. Thank you. All right. Have an amazing day.